Well, I think I know how it happened that I got stuck with the topic on beauty. I think that Logan was thinking beauty, and then I came to mind. Um, well, first I want to talk about something akin to beauty, and uh, that is cuteness. Cuteness. What is it that makes something cute? Um, cuteness is a reality. Things are cute or not cute. Things are sometimes less cute than others and more cute than others. Um, and so cuteness is something that actually exists. And people would agree that, yes, this is cute. And people would say that this is not cute. Um, that's just something that is a phenomena that we see in our world. And... Answers in Genesis had put out a magazine that went in to study the science of cuteness and what it is that really makes up something that is cute. And so if you had a picture before you of a, well, we'll use, the, we'll use a baby instead of a puppy. But if you had a baby in front of you, um, and you had an, and it was normal, right? Normal in the sense that it had all the features that a baby usually has. Big cheeks, big eyes, big forehead, bigger head than, the, than is normal for a head to be on a body. And there's that soft, cute surface. We would say that that is cute. And there would be immediately a reaction inside of us that would be drawn to that image. We would have a smile and our eyes would do something like they're starting to be dazzled with this little form in front of us. But then if you, if you had that same baby picture, but then you took it onto the computer and you did, well, what is that thing called? Photoshop? If you Photoshop the picture and instead you made the cheeks gaunt and in, inverted, and made the eyes smaller and made the head smaller and shrunk it, cuteness would decrease. And our internal responses to that baby, it would, it, we would know that it's different. We would know that this is something that, this is not that kind of cuteness that we would see in a normal baby and cuteness. And God has hardwired this into us, and it seems in the, art, in the science of cuteness that the reason why God has made things cute and adorable is so that we would have such a protection of that thing or of that person. There immediately comes a response into us of warm feelings for that thing, a sense of uh, duty to protect that thing and to come and be close to it and moderate our behavior and our tone even towards that person, that little person, because we, we want to preserve that and we enjoy that moment. Beauty is something like this. Beauty exists. And what I am going to say here might uh, might step on some toes, at least because we come from a Western culture, which in our culture is very postmodern, meaning truth is relative. And you can say that one thing is true, but I can just say that another thing is true. Those two things can, in your mind, contradict, but that really doesn't matter. Because truth is up to me and truth is up to you. And the same thing with morality. 
Morality usually is something that can be governed by time, where you are in history, and then location, where you are in the world. And it's all up to these different people and an agreement made by the people that this, in fact, is immoral. This is good morality. And so you have in the West and infiltrating around the world this idea that both truth are relative and goodness is relative. And then you have the third thing that makes up this triangle, which actually goes together quite perfectly, is that beauty is also very relative. What is the statement that would really capture this idea that beauty is relative? Yes, beauty. Where is it located? It is not objective. It's not out there. It's in here. And if I look at garbage and it is strewn out over this piano, let's say, okay, and I take a picture of that and I frame it and then I hang it up in an art gallery, people are going to come into that art gallery and they're going to have different thoughts about that. But if my thought is beauty is in the eye of the beholder and I think that that is beautiful, then anything goes. Anything goes. And you can't make any sort of judgment upon anyone's view of art. And beauty, if it's found not only in art, like a picture, but in various different art forms like music, anything goes. And so you can have an artist who has a, he's going to break a world record for having the longest song in the world. And it's going to go on for years and years and years and years. And it's going to play the notes so slow that you don't even hear one note to the next. But if the beauty is in the eye of the beholder, then that is something that is actually, you could congratulate that man for discovering and putting on the media something that is so interesting, so intriguing. That is garbage. That's not art. And the reason why that I can say that, and I'm not smug in saying it, is because beauty is something that exists, just like cuteness is something that exists, and that it is something that is given by God, the ultimate giver of all good gifts, and he does it, but he has it. Now, I'm not going to say that God has cuteness. And I'm going to say that he doesn't have cuteness because I think that if he did have cuteness, then the same kind of responses that we have for things that are lesser than ourselves, that kind of psychology would play in our minds too. God is infinitely supreme. He is the king of kings, just as this is the song of songs. And so we should come into God's presence with a sense of awe at his majesty, at his grandeur, at his infinitude. And we would, our eyes would not only squint, but that we would not be able to behold the fullness of his glory. And that's not cute. To call God cute would be irreverent. But to call God beautiful is biblical. Right? Scripture says God is beautiful. He is the king in his beauty. And so beauty is something that transcends just creation. It's communicated to creation, but it's something where we find some exemplar of beauty. And it's not just Adam and Eve and their native, original, 
perfection, well, not perfection, but native original righteousness, unfallenness, innocence. But it's something that we find right in God himself. And beauty, if you would define it, we all have some normals for what beauty is. Even though you go across time, and if you went across to the other side of the world, you would find different forms of what someone would, or what cultures would think are beautiful and what they are attracted to. But even within that, there are some norms. And so God is the norming norm. He's the one where all essential beauty lies. And he has got such an array of everything that is desirable in a being that to see God, we lack nothing else. We, we don't want anything but to see his face. And that, in Revelation 22, will be the best thing ever and the best thing for us. And beauty does something internally. Just like cuteness, seeing a cute puppy or a cute baby, something internally happens. And there's neurons firing in our brains and they can capture that and see something is different when a person in, the, in their brain, they see a cute face. Things are going on rather than when they see an adult face. In the same way, something goes on inside. That when we see beauty, there is an appreciation, there is a delight that goes on in our brains, in our hearts. And when we will see the Lord in his beauty, there will be a delight. A delight that will never decrease, a delight that will never be tainted by anything else, a delight that will not have any ounce of selfishness, but that to gaze upon the Lord in his glory, it will be everything that our hearts were made for. It, it is, he is supremely perfect, and we can see him as he is, and that will transform us. It will be glorifying. So beauty. Beauty is something that... Um, is bigger than ourselves. And beauty is something that is so big that while I say it is objective, it is found in God, he is the original beautiful one and the best beautiful one, and that any beauty that is in creation, not just in humans, but in the world around us, is communicated from God to creation. And it is so big that around the world there are different cultures that capture one corner of what beauty is over here. And then over in another culture, they will capture another corner or facet of what this gem of beauty is. For instance, this is a song, and it is the Song of Songs. And if you were to go into Cambodia, and you were to listen to a love song over there, they would express it in such a way that to our ears, I doubt would, we would find it very beautiful. For instance, they would sing to their lover something like this. And they would make all of these long nasally sounds. And there would be a synthesizer in the background rather than any kind of... And, and on that synthesizer, there would also be like a kick bass and drums and kind of stuff going on. And that, put to music, would be attractive for the opposite sex. But for us over here, love songs come in the form of... Country music. <laughs> Country, not only country, but there are some usual forms of love songs, and they are found in country music. Now, if you put that over in the East, they would look at that, 
And some of them would buy into it and think, yeah, actually, I like this. And they would start singing those songs, even singing them in English, though they don't understand what they're singing. Right? Like they sing, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Anyways, all of that, because there is something that we are, as creatures, latching onto, hidden or in various degrees, exposed in nature, in creation, there are norms for what beauty is. And some people are digging around and latching onto it. God has not hidden his beauty from our sight so much that you can't look at the sun or the moon or the stars and not think that that declares the glory of God. God is so beautiful that he is drop-dead gorgeous. To go into his presence, you will die. Because, not because he's so bad, but because he's so good. And because we are so bad. And in light of his beauty, we are deformed and ugly and wretched and poor and blind and naked. And there would be nothing in us that would be desirable for God, that he should love us, that he should draw us, that he should call us to himself. Nothing that he could gain by having us. And so it is all to the manifestation of his glory, all to the manifestation of his own beauty, that he grants salvation to sinners, that he beautifies the meek, with salvation. So this is a long introduction, and I, I have to be honest with you, I have notes, I have a lot of notes, but they're so scattery, they're, they're not beautiful notes. Um, but I am thankful for what I've read from Dr. Logan on his dissertation <laughs> of Song of, Song of Solomon. <laughs> And I'm thankful for the resources that he has uh, uh, picked my brain or caused me to really think about. But uh, there are several people in the world who are looking at beauty and looking at trying to reason from general creation, general revelation, what God has communicated of himself generally to all people at all times and all places. And they are actually looking at this and actually seeing, okay, I think I got it which is what we were created in God's image to do. God made mankind in his image, Genesis 1, 26 and following, to be able to be like God in ways. To be able to, like God, named things, called the day, called the, the, the light day, and called the darkness night. We imitate God in ways which it's, it's perfectly fine to do. We can't imitate God in, our, in his omnipresence because that's impossible. But there are ways in which we can imitate God, and we are commanded and commissioned to do so in dominion over the earth. One of those things in the garden was to name certain animals, well, animal animals, what their names would be. And so it is completely creaturely and being made in his image to try and capture with words, what is the essence of this thing, okay? Part of mathematics is looking at numbers. What is a number? A number is really, it's abstract. It's something that you can't grab hold of, but you can name it, right? And you can express it in various forms. You can write down one tick, if you were uh, using Latin, Roman uh, numerals, for one. But what is one? One is one. One is, one actually exists, but you can't actually grab hold of it. You can have one finger. You have actually five on one hand. Um, it is amazing to think about this thing. And it boggles the mind. But... God has made man to actually name things and capture what is the essence of that thing and so 
those who write lexicons and dictionaries, if they're doing a true, accurate, good job, they're going to actually lay hold of something and say, this is what it is. Okay? If they're telling the truth. And so some have looked out into general revelation and picked up and unearthed what it is and captured the essence of what beauty is, really, even across the board, across culture, across time, these are some of the norms that we look for and we see when we think of beauty. One man in particular, his name is Sir Richard, no, Sir Robert Scruton. I am sorry, yes. And he's got several kind of um, platitudes for what beauty is. Okay? Number one, beauty pleases us. And that should be, if you think about it, you see something beautiful. I'm looking at someone right now. Beauty pleases us. It has an effect on the mind and in the heart. Two, one thing can be more beautiful than another. We're going to see that in Song of Solomon. Three, beauty is always a reason for attending to the things that possess it. Number four, beauty is the subject matter of a judgment, the judgment of taste. When we're made in God's image, we are made to judge, right? And we are to not judge the way that the Pharisees judged and Jesus criticized. He himself rightly judged and said, judge not that you may not be judged. We are to express a right kind of judgment. Art that is deemed art in the eyes of the world, but is no art in your eyes and ought not to be, that is just garbage strewn over a piano, ought to meet with some sort of judgment in our eyes. And we ought to have our taste refined by what God declares good and by what God says is evil. And if we go any farther and we eat from that tree of knowing good and evil for ourselves, I can make whatever judgments I want. I can declare this is beautiful, this is good, this is bad, this is evil. Arbitrarily, you have fallen, and there are many who have fallen behind you, and it is all because you're fallen in Adam. Five, the judgment of taste is about the beautiful object, not about the subject's state of mind. In describing an object as beautiful, I am describing it, not me. Number six, nevertheless, there are no second-hand judgments about beauty. There is no way that you can argue me into a judgment that I have not made for myself, nor can I become an expert in beauty simply by studying what others have said about beautiful objects and without experiencing and judging for myself. I can tell you all about the Mona Lisa, let's say. But until you have actually seen the Mona Lisa, whether on the internet or actually in person, then I can describe it all I want, but you can't actually appreciate that for yourself. And this is an area when we are talking about marriage, and cultivating beauty in the context of your marriage, it's very personal, and only one other person can appreciate that one person's beauty. And this is what it's for, saving the marriage bed and honoring that marriage bed and cultivating beauty and not having your beauty Let's switch the words from cistern or your water to beauty. Having your beauty laid open there for on the art gallery for the whole world to see. Beauty is meant for your other person. And they are going to see that. And it's for their, if beauty does what it should do, it's for their enjoyment. Beauty pleases us. Beauty is not bad, and beauty is something that brings pleasure. 
Now, okay, I've said a lot about this. Beauty in the Old Testament. And what I've said so far, I hope that you see, um, I, I'm going to bring this up again, New Testament, usually we come into this either with the beauty is the in the eye of the beholder mentality, or we relegate physical beauty to a really it doesn't matter. There's really no need for it. Let's not talk about it. Beauty is sheerly and merely spiritual and figurative. And while I agree, there's this is a huge dimension that really ought to overshadow physical dimensions of beauty, there is something which the Old Testament and the New picks up on when it talks about outward physical beauty. In 1 Samuel 17, 42, when we look at the Hebrew word beauty, yapa, um, this is something that can be used for both a man to describe his handsomeness, we would say, and for a woman to describe her beauty. And so in 1 Samuel 17, 42, in the context of David and Goliath, and when the Philistine, it says, looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was a youth, ruddy, that's like reddish in complexion, and handsome in appearance. Yapa mere. And so this word beauty, which we have translated handsome, and it is not internal, it is external and physical. This is something that was quite obvious, not just to the Philistine, but it's obvious to the narrator as well. And it's something that is uh, apparent when you would look at David. Now, we don't have any other kind of description of what this is. Well, what is beauty? But apparently he had it, right? Goliath, the Philistine, looked down on David, not just because he physically had to, but because David had the face of a pretty boy. Now, you talk about David and pretty boy, but pretty boy kills lions and bears. And he is smart and godly and respectful and all of these things. Beauty may be physical, but it is a complement in the scriptures to talk about the physical beauty of someone as an outward expression of what is going on inside. 1 Samuel 25, verse 3. You can stay in 1 Samuel there. 25, verse 3. Now the man, this is talking about good old Nabal, Naval. And Abigail. And there's a kind of like a chiasm going on here. In poetry, it states A, then B, then B, then A. And so it's kind of like an X. That's why chiasm, that's why that's called that. Now, the name of the man was Nabal, which means foolish, stupid, B. And the name of his wife. Abigail, name means my father's joy. Here's another, the other B, talking about Abigail. The woman was discerning, meaning having good understanding, and beautiful. There's that word, yapa. So both for a male and for a female, this word is used. But the man was harsh meaning he was difficult and badly behaved. He had bad doings. His name, or he was a Calebite. This outward beauty is something that is picked up on here. It's important to the description of this person, Abigail. But it doesn't actually say, well, here's what beauty is. This is what her hair looked like. This is what her, um, her teeth were like. This is all of that and the other. It just says that she is beautiful, and he, on the other hand, is stupid. He's harsh. He's badly behaved. And then you don't even need any kind of a physical 
portrait of the man because you've already seen the man. This is what he's like. And that's all that matters. If he's like this, such a, an, an ignorant person that no one can even say anything to him, and his name, the very name he has in God's providence and in the word forever to be known, except in the book of life, is Nabal. You already know him front and back. You know what he looks like. And that's all that has to be said about him. Genesis 12, 11 and 12, 14, we also see uh, beauty described, uh, ascribed to Sarai, Abraham's wife. Now, when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. <laughs> and uh, he says, I know this. I know this for certain. I know this not just as a subjective judgment I'm only making in a vacuum, but this is going to have consequences. You're a beautiful woman, and these others surrounding are going to see that you are beautiful, and then they are going to snatch you away from me, and they're going to kill me. And so he in, makes the conclusion, lie for me, and, uh, and then I'll be safe. In verse 14, when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And if you add a very at the beginning, in Hebrew you'd add a mayod, which strengthens anything uh, that, it, that follows it. Just mayod, beautiful. And so it's not just the judgment of Abram, but it's the judgment of others outside. In Genesis 27, 19, Leah's eyes, he's talking about Ra uh, Leah versus Rachel. And Leah's eyes were, were weak, which could mean, in a positive sense, looking on the outside, well, her eyes were, were gentle. Um, but more likely it means her eyes were dull. Uh, but Rachel, on the other hand, was beautiful in form and appearance. In the Hebrew, beautiful in form and in beautiful in appearance. Yapa, toar, that's beautiful in form, and yapa mare. And so we go through this, and we see that there is some outward aspects of beauty. What we are told is that these Persons in question are beautiful. What we don't have is what the specifics of the outward manifestations were. And in Scripture, this word beauty has to do with fittingness. Okay? Something that is there's rightness to it. There's something, this fits. And in Ecclesiastes 5.18, the same word, yapa, is used for the word fitting. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given for him. This, for this is his lot. Fittingness has to do with beauty. And so words that would connote or capture what beauty is would be a justness, a fittingness, a symmetry. And even in something that is asymmetrical, there is still a bit of symmetry there. If you look at the hair of someone who is asymmetrical, you have to have things in proportion so that something up here is going to make up for something down here. And so we're still ending up with some symmetry, some fittingness, it's proper. But if you have hair that is all the way over here and then nothing over here, it's going to look weird. And maybe the person is going for weird, but it's not going to be beautiful. 
And uh, it's not going to be aesthetically pleasing because it's not fitting. There is a fittingness, a fitness to beauty. And this is brought out in the Song of Solomon, where things on this lady are fitting. Your lips. They're not just lips that work in that sense of fittingness. But these are good lips. These are the ideal form of what lips ought to be. And when someone is saying that, they're complimenting that person. Not saying that you are different from others in the sense you're altogether other, but that you have what is that norm that all the others get their good lips from. Sure, there's good lips over here, and there's better lips over here, but you really have the best lips. These lips are what other lips envy, right? And that is a compliment. That's paying a compliment. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that, as we're going to see. This is, book is full of compliments, which is part of being an image of God. Okay, so beauty in the Old Testament. It is something that is, it does take on a physical form. Now, just hold on a second. Don't take me for saying that beauty is only physical and that I am shallow. Um, but beauty is something that is a physical uh, quality. And if you look for definitions around this kind of uh, capturing of what beauty is, there are some good ones. In um, the Dictionary of Biblical Languages with Semantic Domains, beauty is said to be harmonious combination of qualities pleasant to see. Harmonious, okay? If you think of the opposite of harmonious, what is that? Disorder, chaos. Chaos is something that God subdued and brought everything into a shining, beautiful, proportionate, orderly creation that we call, or that the Greeks called cosmos. Which is why when somebody studies cosmetology, there is a science to it. There's an orderliness to things. There's a symmetry to things. There's a proportionate to things. And the Bible captures this in the 1828 Dictionary, the American Dictionary of 1828, which is a great dictionary, by the way. It says, beauty, an assemblage of graces or an assemblage of properties in the form of the person or any other object which pleases the eye. In the person, due proportion or symmetry of parts constitutes the most essential property to which we annex the term beauty. Number five in his, down in his um, uh, description of, of this and definition of this in the arts, symmetry of parts, harmony, justness of composition. There is a song, I will admit, I think it's pretty good out there. Uh, and it's by Bruno Mars, uh, when he says that uh, you are, oh, somebody's got to help me. Who's been listening to Bruno Mars? <laughs> You're beautiful just the way that you are. I wouldn't change a thing about you. You're beautiful. You're lovely just the way that you are. And what I'm going to go through here is that this is exactly it. The lovers love each other for who they are. The lovers love each other as they are. The lovers pick up on different component parts of each other and say, you're lovely. You're beautiful. And what I want to get from this, and that I think that is just that we would get from this, is that as you are, there's already loveliness and beauty there. We are made in God's image. And as physical creatures made in God's image, 
It is a beautiful composition that God has made. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. A person standing upright, excuse me, is symmetrical. That's amazing. Now, a crab is symmetrical as well. But a crab, though having qualities of beauty to it, is not something attractive. A human being is a beautiful thing. Our faces have such symmetry and proportion to them that it is astounding. And you go down into the nitty-gritty and you look at the eyeball and you see the iris and how it opens and closes in order to take in less or more light. And it just is exquisite how this master maker has built each part of our body. And the more that you study someone, the more that you're going to pick up little hints of how the creator has crafted this magnificent design. That being said, each of us is going to be attracted to different kinds of people. Just as surely as there are different personalities, different personalities are going to attract us. And a person is more than just his or her looks. There is a beauty that goes skin deep, but no further, which is like that pig with a ring of gold in its snout. You have no character to make up for it. And if you are truly using your reason the way God intended men in this congregation, you would not be satisfied being married to or using a bimbo. Someone that is an airhead, that has no kind of thoughts upstairs as to the deepest things of life. Someone that you can't talk to and share your feelings and deepest emotions to and pray with. You'd not be satisfied. And I know that because Solomon, the wisest man in the world, had 700, 1,000 women. And he says it's all vanity. It's all fleeting. It doesn't actually satisfy your soul. And you are not only a body, but a soul. Well, beauty is something that for women, as we see in verse 5 of chapter 1, is something that she doubts of herself. Looking at her own self, she may concede I'm lovely, but this word is I am black. Not having anything to do with the skin color of someone that they are um, black or white, but meaning in the culture of this time, in this setting, to be Shades darker than you would be if you were in the palace out of the sun or if you were richer out of the sun most of the day meant you are lower on the caste system, so to speak. You would be looked down on by others because you are poorer. You're darker. And this is what she complains of. I am black. But lovely, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, she addresses, and we're going to see this time and again, those virgin daughters of Jerusalem, the women that Solomon compares her to and says, you're better than all of them. She addresses them time and time again and says this complaint about herself and compares herself like the Bedouin tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. This is not... A, an expression of, I'm a black beauty, but rather this is a lament over her physical appearance, that this is too dark for her, and that this is too dark in her culture to be viewed as 
beautiful. If you go into the Philippines, they want to be lighter. And you go into Cambodia and Philippines and wherever in the East, what do they have? They have some cream that you rub on your skin and it will make you whiter and whiter and whiter and whiter. But it's a fake white. And to be, we're driving on the moto in Cambodia and people are looking aside at us and, and gawking at us and at our children at this white skin. And, and uh, what in our culture might be called rude, that you're saying that I'm white skin or something like that. Over there, it's completely normal. But what do we do here? You tan, right? There's tanning salons, tanning beds, and you go out in the summer and you get a tan. You want to look darker, right? And so in each side of the world, there's this difference of, I want to be darker, I want to be lighter, but there's this complexion kind of uh, uh, psychology going on in the mind of, this is bad, this is good. And we have it flipped from the east. And over here, this complexion speaks of, of poverty, speaks of, of being low on the, the caste uh, grading. Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. Don't look upon me because the sun's already done that. The sun has already done its looking at me, and here I am. My mother's sons, she gives the reason, were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards. Out in the vineyards, you're out there all day. You're pruning, you're clipping, you're removing stones, you're sowing, you're watering, you're doing all of these different things, building a fence, building a wall, and whatnot. The sun is looking upon you all day, and that looking has an effect. And she says, but my own vineyard I have not kept. My own desirableness, I haven't had the time to keep. I haven't had the energy to keep. I haven't had the ability to keep up my own desirableness as I would want to look, as I would want to appear, not just for others to see, but for the one that I love. Sound familiar? We don't live in a world of ideals. We don't live in paradise. And though we can capture some of paradise and regain some of what was lost, yet we are in a busy, bustling world. And we're in a world that is going to change our form as it is changing its form. And not only is there this a depression over what she looks like, there's also this depression of separation. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon, for why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? Likely meaning, why should I be taken for a, a harlot? And then he responds, and he reassures her. And husbands, this is what we need to do with our wives. We need to respond to the self-criticisms of our wives, and we need to respond with reassurance. Reassurance of her beauty and reassurance of, a, of our closeness. If you do not know, O most beautiful among women, Follow in the tracks of the flock and, and pasture your young goats besides, sorry, beside the shepherd's tents. You can come to me. You can come close to me. Here I am. And I will be there. That's what we should get from this as Christians, as men. Closeness. Intimacy. And there's going to be degrees of separation in our lives. Closeness is what she needs. 
and closeness is what she wants. And there's going to be a difference between you and her of what closeness means sometimes. Closeness, I'm not getting this right from the text, but closeness as an application means more than just 24 seconds of foreplay and sexual intimacy thereafter. But it means relational closeness. It means not sitting just beside your wife the way you would your bro, but that you face your wife and that you ask her good questions and that you listen to her answers. Conviction. I, I, we are not in paradise. This is something that we, as human beings, as Christians, are trying to regain through Christ that paradise that was lost. I compare you, my love. So she's doing comparisons, and she's looking at the tents of Kedar. Has that in her mind as that's what I'm like? Or the tents of, or the curtains of Solomon that are so dark that no light can penetrate them? That's what I'm like. And she is comparing herself to possibly these daughters of Jerusalem. Well, he does the same. But he does it in a redemptive way. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Now, what does that mean? Well, you drive men wild. And I am one of those stallions in Pharaoh's chariots. And I am driven crazy by you. What they would do is if you were going to war and you have a cavalry coming against you, let loose a mare in heat, and the stallions out there that are driving the chariots are going to pick up on the scent of that mare and they're going to be agitated and they're not going to function properly. You make me not function properly. You make me function properly, but you make me not function properly. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. Now, immediately we might have 1 Peter 3 in the back of our minds, maybe nagging us and saying, no, wait, hold on a second. No braided hair, no jewels, no costly apparel. And we impute that to this when instead, and, and we, we might allegorize this and say, okay, well, this is actually talking about how there's lovely graces uh, and virtue and stuff like that. Well, that's not actually what it's talking about. It's actually talking about literal jewelry and ornamentation. Now, there is that kind of ornamentation that's spoken of in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 2, which the women, the daughters of Jerusalem, uh, prance around in, and they have this tinkling as they go by, and they've got their mirrors, and they've got their pendants, and they've got their all of this everything on the outside. And there is that, which the Lord says, I'm going to strip you of that. You're going to be bald, and there's going to be scabs on your head, and it's going to be horrible for you. And instead of a lovely sash, you're going to have a rope for a belt. How about that? This doesn't decry ornamentation, but it does say that it complements your beauty. And so from a, with a, an ethic that is fully informed by the Bible, then you may have a conscience that is a, diametrically opposed to piercings, to tattoos, to I, all sorts of different ornamentation like that. And say, no, I, I take First Peter 3 literally and that I shouldn't even braid my hair. I should have it just plain because plainness is something that will 
show what virtue is going on inside. And I don't want to change your conscience. But here, when we look at the scriptures, beauty is something that can be complemented and can be enhanced and can be something that a man can compliment his wife for. And that is meant for the two of them, enjoying beauty and what pleasure it brings. And it brings pleasure to the woman to be complimented. Others speak now. We will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. This then transitions from the Bedouin tents of following flocks and out in the sun to then transported into the palace of the king now. And we see this here. While the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of En Gedi. Beauty is something that when you have a portrait of something or a painting, you admire it, you look at it, and it comes in through your eyes and hits your optic nerves and registers things to your brain. You appreciate it with that sense of sight. With music, it comes into your ears and you appreciate it with that sense of hearing. With food, you appreciate the taste of the food with that sense that's inlaid in your tongue. With intimacy, there is an array of all the senses. And one of those here that is beautiful, just as we detect what is rank or pungent or stinky with our nose, and that is counted as not beautiful, there are scents that are beautiful. Which in their context, myrrh, henna, nard, a perfume. Perfume, not only the visible ornamentation, but then that invisible but scented ornamentation, if you will, of, of perfume, which then in this it harks back to the Garden of Eden, the vineyards of En Gedi. Um, and we're about to see here our couches green, the beams of our houses are cedar, our rafters are pine. This is something that goes back to the, the, the house of the forest of Lebanon, like Solomon had built. And all of the architecture that Solomon built was to simultaneously point back in time to garden, the Garden of Eden, the two pillars in Solomon's temple, and uh, the pomegranates that are around, that are wreathed on that, those pillars and all of the palm trees, and all of the pomegranates, and all of the open flowers, and the sea, and the bulls under the sea, and all of this stuff. Like that, this is simultaneously pointing back to Eden, and forward to a better Eden, a new creation. And this is right here, right now, right where we are. And so, the movement from out in the shepherd's tents with the flocks and the sheep, transporting into the king's palace and our couch and rafters, and it's a beautiful scene. It's something that is redemptive historical. God brings mankind from the garden into a city, and God brings us from slavery to sin and to righteousness in Christ. Slavery to righteousness in Christ. In application, you can enjoy the full form of your spouse, even if it's on the side of the road. And you can enjoy it in the palace of a king. Airbnb. Now, I say that, and I think that men are usually to think, well, right now, I feel like I could enjoy your beauty. 
And though the day is young, and though there's no preparation required for me, I could enjoy your beauty right here, right now. So women, take from that. It can be enjoyed whenever. Men, you are next. Take from this. The beauty of your wife can be enjoyed in where she thinks it is most lovely, where there's preparation, where there is beautiful fragrances, and where you put in effort, and where you put in money to spend a night in a place at. Okay? I think that this has direct application for that, that we can pick up on. And so that the setting is beautiful. Now there can be a quaintness to shepherd's tents. There can be a beauty that's just natural and rustic. That's beautiful too. But what does, in considering your wife's interests more important than yours, what does your wife prefer? Now continuing, and I think I have, I'm probably over my time. Okay, I'll, I'll finish up really quickly. Chapter 2, verse 1, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. We sing this in hymns as ascribed to Jesus. I don't know why. Um, this is about her, and she's saying that I'm just, I'm common. I'm plain Jane. How does he respond? As a lily among brambles, so is my love among young women. You are better than all the thorns out there. Now, all the common plants, you are most beautiful. As a lily, if you compared it to brambles, well, what kind of effect does that compliment have on the woman? She returns the favor. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among young men, the young men. And so we take from this, we are made in God's image. And being made in God's image, we are to see things and capture them with words. And we are to imitate God just as he deserves all praise for his beauty, his indescribable, ineffable beauty. We are to imitate God as his creatures and love our neighbor as ourselves in praising the beauty of of someone else, our nearest neighbor. And that has an effect. There is now a dialogue. Well, you're beautiful. No, you're beautiful. Men and women, let's compliment the beauty of our spouses, of our spouse, and that will have an effect. And using words, try to find words that our comparisons. Poetry, for some reason, makes good love music and love songs. And it's not enough. I mean, we can read those uh, narrative descriptions of, what, of Rachel and her beauty and all those kind of different things. But if you have a poem and you say, okay, well, that's nice. Please put it to me in prose. You lose the effect. Poetry somehow captures things and puts something beautiful in a beautiful box, in a beautiful frame. Now, I have a poem that I would like to share. I thought I'd write the type of poem for a person that you love, a woman. Not a long, extravagant one. It wouldn't suit her, not this one. Not a sonnet, not a limerick. She would never even hear of it, but an old familiar classic. Ah, here, this one has it. Roses are red, violets are blue, but neither of these describe you. They are way too gaudy, elegant, and while they are distinctly feminine, you bear a much closer resemblance to the wild wildflower, simple fluorescence. Not for sale, not like all others, I'd find you out in nature's wonders. 
Now that's an example of a Western poem that rhymes. This is an Eastern poem that's going to rhyme thoughts. Let's get into God's word and let's capture the beauty that is there in someone else and love them, be outward in loving. And that is going to start a dialogue of love. And we will be more closely conformed to the image of Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time. I pray, Lord, that your blessing would be upon this. And I pray that it would inch us closer to Christ-likeness. And I pray that uh, you would bless the food that is downstairs, as I'm sure uh, the scent has affected our minds and we are now grumbling in our stomachs. I pray that your blessing would be upon it and our fellowship, especially the fellowship between man and woman, as you've created us to reflect your likeness and your holy character and the enjoyment between the persons of the Trinity and the enjoyment between Christ and the church, and that that would mark us out as different than the world who sloppily paints love and sex to be something that it's not and degrades your creation. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.